everyone, welcome back to our channel. My name is Brianna Wilson. I am a certified dementia practitioner and the founder of Bamboo Care. So today's video is part three of our three-part series on the stages of dementia. In part one, we discussed stages one through three. In part two, we discussed stages four and five. And today will be six and seven. If you have not seen part one or two, I will link them in the eye in the sky as well as in the description box below. But I will go ahead and do a quick recap for those who haven't seen the videos as well as those who have. So this is going to be real quick. We're just going to breeze through it so that we can focus on stages six and seven, okay? So stage one is none. So there is no impairment. The brain is healthy and it's functioning normally. Stage two is you, meaning that the memory and thinking changes are evident to you, but those around you can't really tell anything significant, okay? Stage three is me. So me, your friend, your family, your coworkers, we can notice some of these changes in your memory and thinking that are happening. And if you were to take some type of clinical test, the test would likely show that there is some type of mild cognitive impairment as well, okay? So stages one through three are kind of like the pre-dementia stages. Stages four and five are mild, okay, and moderate dementia. So in stage four, you're going to start noticing that breakdown in the complex ADLs or those complex activities of daily living. So think finances, meal prep, grocery shopping, taking care of pets, managing your medications, driving, all those sorts of things. You're going to notice a breakdown in, okay? Stage five, you're going to notice more of a breakdown in those basic activities of daily living, okay? But not so much in the physical sense of being able to put on your clothes or go to the bathroom. It's more in remembering whether or not you've done it or you need to do it. So oftentimes in stage five, there needs to be a lot of cueing and reminders for the person to complete the task, okay? Also, this is where time the concept of time kind of starts to diminish, okay? And that's part of the issue is because they can't remember when something has been done, how much time has passed, okay? That dwindles away, okay? So that leaves us to stage six and stage seven. So let's go ahead and start with stage six. So stage six is moderately severe dementia or severe cognitive impairment or cognitive decline, okay? This is where you're really, really going to notice a breakdown in those basic activities of living. So dressing, bathing, going to the bathroom, feeding themselves, those sorts of things. And this is now beyond just needing a reminder or cue to do it, okay? This is having a really hard time physically doing it. And it can be for a number of reasons, okay? It could be due to decreased contrast sensitivity, decreased depth perception. It can be decreased ability to sequence things. Um, they have a harder time initiating tasks. Motor planning, meaning I know what I want to do, but I can't figure out how to sequence my movements to be able to do that thing, okay? So they are going to need a lot more help and a lot more support. So you're going to notice that maybe they can't dress themselves properly. Maybe they put their shirts on backwards. Maybe when they're trying to put their pants on, they put their legs through the wrong hole. Um, if you put a light colored shirt on a light colored bedding, they have a hard time figuring out where their clothing items are. Sometimes, as it progresses in stage six, they even have a hard time trying to figure out what something is used for. So something like a fork, we know that it's a utensil that we use to eat certain foods with. But to them, they might see the fork and not understand what to do with it, okay? So that's where these issues start to become really evident, okay? This also extends over into remembering to flush the toilet and also remembering how to flush the toilet, okay? This also extends to washing their hands, understanding how to sequence that, like, okay, I gotta turn the water on, I gotta get soap, I gotta wash my hands. The way that I wash my hands is like this, I gotta get all parts. 
okay, I need to turn it off, I need to dry my hands, those sorts of things. And if you think about it, we all kind of sequence it differently. Some people put soap in their hands first, turn on the faucets, wash. Some people dry their hands before turning it off. So this can look a little bit different for every person, but there's a breakdown in sequencing that, being able to put all those things together. Um, sometimes what you notice is maybe they can brush their teeth if you set it up for them. They can brush their teeth, right? But they might just stay in one place and not move on. They'll just stay there. And then you have to say, oh, don't forget to get the other side of your mouth. And then they'll go and then you might have to cue them until they complete their whole mouth. But then after that, they might not remember what to do with the toothpaste in their mouth. So some will swallow, okay? And others, you have to cue, okay, make sure you spit it out. You know, so it's that kind of breakdown. This is also where you start noticing more incontinent episodes of the urine and the bowels, okay? Usually when somebody becomes incontinent, it's going to be urine incontinence first and then eventually bowel incontinence, okay? So you'll start noticing this more. You'll also start noticing more episodes of them urinating or defecating in odd places, like for example, maybe they'll urinate in a trash can or in a plant, or um, you might notice that they're having a hard time just making it to the bathroom in general. You may also start noticing changes in things like their sleep patterns or in their personality and behaviors. So maybe you notice they're becoming increasingly more agitated or aggressive, or maybe this is where they start having more delusions or hallucinations, or maybe they start wandering more, which can become problematic as well, okay? Another thing we have to think about is time. So in stage five, I told you that there was kind of this breakdown in the concept of time. So that concept of time is more so 20 minutes feeling like two hours or two hours feeling like 20 minutes or one day feeling like 30 minutes. You know, this concept of time is kind of fluid. But in stage six, what you start noticing is that it's almost as if they're on a whole separate timeline and then there still is this diminished concept of time within the timeline. So for example, say your name is Amy, you're the daughter, okay? You are 52 years old. Sometimes what happens is it's not necessarily that they don't remember that they have a daughter and that their daughter's name is Amy, but the Amy that they remember is on a separate timeline. So maybe the Amy that they remember is eight-year-old Amy, not 52-year-old Amy. So if they ask you, where's Amy? Have you seen Amy? And you're thinking, I'm right here. What do you mean I'm right here? Usually it's because the Amy that they're remembering is on a separate timeline. So it's not necessarily that they don't remember you. It's just that the 52-year-old you and the eight-year-old you is not you. Does that make sense? So in stage six, you really start noticing that they're kind of on this separate timeline in a sense. And this timeline can change. So one day they can be here, okay? And then another day or a few days later, they can be here. It just kind of depends, okay? Another thing that kind of throws people off is that there can be these fluctuating moments of confusion and lucidity where some days they're just like really, really confused and they're really somewhere else, okay? And then there's other days where it seems like they kind of have a better feel for what's going on and who you are and things like that. So that kind of throws people off because they don't understand why that's happening. And it's just the brain. The brain is a very amazing thing. It's very complex and we know very little about it is the easiest way to explain it, okay? Another thing you'll start noticing is increased difficulty with speech as well as decreased inability to like be able to count backwards from say like 10. Being able to say 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, that diminishes, okay? Also, they might occasionally forget the names of their spouse or their children or things like that. Again, it might fluctuate, 
but usually, not always, it kind of just depends where they're at in their timeline, but usually they can recognize familiar faces in the sense like, oh, you look familiar. I recognize you. You don't. Because I've had quite a few patients where they can't remember my name, but they can remember that they've seen me before, okay? They don't remember what I was there for, why, what, you know, but they just remember that's a recognizable face, okay? So, but that varies. So it kind of just depends. So stage six can be incredibly difficult for care partners because not only is your partner now needing more assist, but now you're getting these increased episodes of incontinence, which makes things difficult. Plus, you may notice changes in their sleep patterns, right? You may notice changes in their personality or behavior, right? And so all this together can create some especially unique challenges that you are faced with. And what I want to tell you is that stage five, it was super important to have a routine. Stage six, it's going to be even more important to have a routine. People with dementia, and usually just people in general for the most part, tend to fare better with some kind of routine. And by routine, I don't mean at this time you have to do a certain thing, at this time you have to do a certain thing, at this time you have to do a certain thing. That's more of like a schedule, which does work for some people, but it's better if you have something that's more time fluid, which is a routine, meaning that you do things in the same order. That helps because it doesn't matter what time the person wakes up, okay? You kind of have this routine that you have. First we do this, once we do that, we do this, we do this, we do this. That tends to work a lot better than if you don't have a routine, okay? You also want to try not to overhelp. When a person is having all these difficulties, it becomes very easy to want to just step in and do it for the person. But I want to encourage you to try to let them do as much as they can for themselves, whether that means setting up environmental supports, so making the environment more friendly, whether that means just cueing them, maybe giving them a visual demonstration or physically cueing them or walking through the task with them step by step. You really want to encourage them to be active participants in their care. And honestly, the longer you can get them to actively participate in a task, the longer they'll be able to do it. It's one of those things, if you don't do it, you lose it, okay? And so it's important that you try to keep them involved and refrain from just doing everything for them. Especially, especially, especially at stage six, where it becomes so easy to just do it for them because it's quicker, it's more convenient, and there's just less fuss, right? So that's kind of like my tip, suggestion, advice, okay, for stage six. Now, stage seven is severe dementia or very severe cognitive decline or impairment. This is where the body is slowly starting to kind of shut down and they're slowly beginning to lose their function. So their speech will become limited and for some, speech may become non-existent altogether. You may start noticing impairments in their swallowing, okay? So you might have to change the food consistency, and even then, they may still have issues, which puts them at an increased risk for aspiration, so you have to really watch that. And it could eventually advance to the point where they're refusing food and water altogether, okay? Another thing that starts happening is they begin to lose the ability to walk and the ability to control their movements. Also, they might exhibit like abnormal reflexes or rigidity as they kind of progress through stage seven, okay? So that's important to know because eventually they will become bedridden or wheelchair bound. But even in a wheelchair, you may notice that they have a hard time keeping themselves upright, okay? So usually they end up becoming bed bound. But because they become bed bound or chair bound, it puts them at increased risk for bed sores. So you really have to make sure that 
you're changing their positions frequently, even every two hours if you can. I know for some caregivers it's really hard to do that. I say four hours max, but two hours ideally, you want to change their position, okay? Even if it's just shifting them around in bed. Just think, like for example, when you sleep, there's very few of us who stay in that same static position all night. Most of us shift at least a little bit in our sleep, okay? So it's really important that you move them out of that position so that they do not get bed sores, okay? Because bed sores, once you get them, they're super hard to heal, okay? So if you can just avoid them altogether, that's ideal. Another thing that you have to watch out for is in stage seven, they're more prone to repeated infections. This can be pneumonia from the aspiration. This could be something like a UTI, a urinary tract infection. So you just want to be mindful that these things can occur more frequently in stage seven. Now, something that really throws caregivers off in stage seven is just like stage six, they may have these moments of complete confusion and lucidity where it's kind of like for a brief moment, they kind of have some idea of what's going on and who you are and things like that. And it's very intriguing for caregivers and for myself as well. And it's very hard to understand, but it is something that happens that I want you to be aware of is completely normal in stage seven, okay? So when we think about stage seven, what is most important? And honestly, the answer to that is comfort and quality of life. You want to keep them as comfortable as possible. And that extends down to the mattress that you're using, the mattress pad, chair cushions, pillows, right? You want to make sure that they're comfortable. The temperature of the room, okay? You want to make sure that they're comfortable things like that, not too bright of lights if they're light sensitive, right? Not too loud of noise if they're auditory sensitive, those types of things. So things you can do, because sometimes I know a lot of people have a hard time at stage seven trying to figure out, you know, what can I do, okay? Some people really like just to have their hand stroked or their head and hair stroked or their cheek stroked. Okay, you can sing to them. You can, you know, put lotion on their body and kind of just make sure that their skin is not all dry and flaky and especially the feet because I feel like the feet are oftentimes neglected. You want to keep the feet clean, dry, but moisturized, okay? Feet are important. <laughs> Another thing you can do is play soft music in the background. Sometimes like instrumental type music fares better than words, but it kind of just depends on the person. You can open the windows, let some fresh air in. You can open the blinds, let some daylight in, okay? Another thing you can do is things to kind of stimulate the vision. So for some people, they'll start sleeping a lot in stage seven, and this is more because the body is shutting down. Whereas in other stages, they might be sleeping more because they're just not being stimulated. So just for example, if you were in a room with nothing to do, you might go to sleep, right? But at stage seven, they begin sleeping more because the body is slowly starting to shut down in most cases, okay? So visual stimuli, if they are keeping their eyes open, could be like if they have a window, putting like a bird feeder outside the window so they can see birds and squirrels that might come small fish tanks so they can watch the fishies. Um, some even like looking at the little mobiles, kind of like you would put over like a baby's crib, but they have different ones. Um, you can put, you know, different mobiles above their bed that they can look at. Um, maybe a nice pleasant picture of something. So there are still some things that you can do to keep the person comfortable, but also kind of ensure that they still have a good quality of life as they're dementia is slowly progressing and as they're slowly starting to lose their functioning, okay? So those are the last two final stages, six and seven, which is moderately severe dementia and severe dementia. And six and seven are important stages, as are the others, 
but are especially important stages because I think it really brings to light that dementia is terminal and it is progressive. And the unfortunate thing about dementia, if the person does not pass away from something else like a heart attack, a stroke, complications due to diabetes, um, like pneumonia or some type of infection, they ultimately will pass away due to their dementia because the brain is dying and the body is shutting down, okay? And again, like I always say, I don't say this to scare you. I simply say this to inform you. This is why when a person gets the diagnosis of dementia, it's important that you start planning and preparing because as the dementia progresses, which the timeline looks a little bit different for everybody as far as how they progress through these stages, what that looks like, though that differs, the end result is fairly the same, okay? For most people, no matter what type of dementia they may have, stages six and seven look very, very similar, okay? So I just want you to keep that in mind. I really do hope that this video was helpful and informative as well as the other two parts of this series. If you have any questions about any of the stages, whether it be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, please leave a comment down in the comment section or if you feel more comfortable, you can email us. You can find that in the description box below. Also remember you can find our website as well as all of our social media links in the description box as well. And until next time.